you, Nick. Thank you, Janet, for that generous introduction. Now I'll tell you who I really am. <laughs> um, no, it's really it's great to be among the next generation of people who are going to improve the world. You know, when I look at you, I can just see all this potential. Uh, and you know, let's face it, the world needs a lot of improving, especially now. So, um, what I'll do is kind of uh, tell you some yarns about how we organized Finca, the kind of winding path we took, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end where I can hear from you guys. Um, so let's jump into it. And the first thing we're going to do, um, you guys probably don't know anything about social networking, right? I mean... It's really cool. I mean, there's this thing called the internet, you know, and you can go on it and everything. But seriously, I've kind of mastered or half mastered the dark arts of social media. And uh, so what we're going to do, we'll have a little fun tonight. We're posing a question to all of you. How can social entrepreneurship change the world? And uh, not to distract you while I'm, you know, eloquently presenting my stuff here, but by the end... We're going to uh, look at your tweets. We have some people off-site in a secret center in northern Virginia who are going to be processing the results and choosing the best answer. And the winner gets a copy of my book. How about that? You know what I mean? And I need to have a disclaimer. I'm actually not going to make any royalties on this. I don't want to charge you guys. I was a student once, and I know you can put that eight, uh, that 14 or $20 to much better use probably than buying my book. Uh, I think, what is a handle of, of what's his name, Captain Morgan Spice Rum? About. But the book might last longer, and who knows? You might find something interesting there. But anyway... So if you have your little tweeting machines, uh, you respond, use the hashtag SEH, Social Entrepreneur's Handbook, uh, and, and hashtag SOSINT for social enterprise, I guess. All right. Um, so anyway, um, you know, I guess theoretically, what do we need to start a social enterprise? Well, an idea and a plan. Um, and I think that's pretty straightforward. But uh, what I would like you to sort of think about is, you know, this is not an easy field. It, it, many times it's not one where you're going to get wealthy or famous, uh, but it is a massively satisfying kind of work, you know, to see people in need, people who got a raw deal somehow, people who are, you know, on the receiving end of prejudice or injustice and help them get out of that situation of desperation and dependence. Um, and so what I'm going to argue tonight is that the most important thing for you at this stage is to figure out what are you passionate about? You know, what injustices in the world or big problems, you know, kind of engage you and you think, I want to do something about that. You know? I mean, could be a problem like a terrifying problem like global warming, you know, which nobody, let's face it, nobody's doing anything about, basically. Or it could be, you know, people in your neighborhood who are getting a raw deal or people in a country that are living in virtual slavery and you want to get them out. You want to help them. And so you're asking yourself, okay, uh, I've discovered what I care about. Now what? Where do I begin? So let me tell you my story. Um, when I was your age, and don't look at me as I am now, you know, a, a wreck, a broken down, <laughs> sexagenarian. Uh, but, you know, when I was your age, and uh, I was finishing up my senior year at Brown, and, uh, you know, there was a lot going on in the world, and the big thing going on in the world was the Vietnam War, and the war had reached the state which John Kerry described as, uh, it was at the point where nobody wanted to die, uh, be the last man to die for a mistake. Everybody recognized the war was a disaster, uh, 50,000 people killed, money lost. Um, and so we had this strange little thing my senior year in the spring 
just before I was going to graduate, there was a lottery, but it was a lottery where if you won, you lost. And what they did was they put all our birth dates in this big urn, and they spun it around, and the first hundred birthdays that they picked out were all going to be drafted and sent to Vietnam. So we gathered around the television that night, of course, in the fraternity, watching, you know, pouring down the beer, laughing, ha ha ha's, one by one, you know, the, the people fell or escaped. And I got a 67, so my life completely changed at that point. I didn't have any focus, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. But now I had a situation where I needed to make some pretty serious decisions. Um, I had some options. I could, uh, you know, go to Canada and maybe never see my friends and family again. Uh, I could go to jail, and some of my uh, classmates did exactly that. Um, or I could go to Vietnam and fight for a cause I didn't believe in and possibly die or come back maimed. So that was a bad plan. So I discovered that there was uh, an alternative. There was this thing called the Peace Corps. <coughs> Excuse me, and you could get, uh, and this is where luck comes in, and I'm going to argue that there's a lot of luck to the path you eventually end up on. Um, and it's not all deliberate plan, I'm going to do this and that. So in, in my case, I, uh, I found out that I could get a two-year deferment from the Selective Service uh, if I went into the Peace Corps. And I thought, okay, two years, anything could happen. The war could end. The draft could end. As it turned out, the draft did end, and the war did end. Um, so I went through the process, and, you know, they found me a suitable candidate. And they said, so where would you like to go? And I said, Jamaica. And uh, they said, no, come on. You know, uh, we're going to send you to Guatemala, and we're going to attach you to an, an agricultural cooperative and you're going to be an agricultural extension agent. And I said, uh, you do understand I was born in New York City, right? Not Iowa. I said, don't worry about it. You know, you'll learn. So they sent me off to uh, work at this cooperative. And my job was basically, you know, I, 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 I did a little training in Spanish in Mexico, a little training in agriculture in Costa Rica. Uh, but by the time they sent me to Guatemala, I was more of a threat to the farmers' crops than a benefit. So I, I quickly realized I wasn't going to teach them anything about agriculture. Um, but I did sort of have in my DNA, as probably all of you do, uh, a certain methodology for solving problems. I think this is kind of passed down to us. We you know, say we've got a problem, we organize a committee, we elect leaders, we develop a plan, we execute it. So I figured I could be useful on the financial side. And so uh, I organized these farmers into groups. I had about 800 of them. And they were spread out over this huge area and, you know, 30 different little hamlets. Um, and so the idea was, you know, we would, you know, these people were cruelly exploited. They were Mayan Indians. They worked on the farms of the wealthy landlords. Uh, but part of the deal was, you know, the landlords would give them a little piece of land that they could farm and grow their food on. Now, the problem was the land, after generations of being worked, was very depleted, and so the crops weren't doing that well. And so we found that if we gave them a $50 loan in fertilizer, that they uh, could realize triple, sometimes quadruple yields just from that input of nutrients. So, great. Sounded wonderful. So I organized all these groups. I told them, we're going to make you these loans. You'll repay them over a period of six months. We'll charge you 1% interest a month. Um, they said, great, sign me up. Um, and then we started to run into problems that first year. We ordered the fertilizer from Houston or something like that, New Orleans. Uh, they didn't order it in time. By the time it arrived in Guatemala, uh, the customs people held it hostage for a while. And meanwhile, it's starting to rain. And the roads to these people's hamlets are turning into mud. And every day, the farmers I recruited to this cooperative are coming to my house saying, 
where's the fertilizer? Where, you know, come on, we got a plant. We got to put the fertilizer on. And I said, it's coming, it's coming. Finally, I went down to the co-op office, and the uh, manager told me, said, look, Rupert, uh, you got to tell them the truth. We can't get it to them, you know. I said, well, what do I do, you know? I mean, I, I have to live there. He said, oh, well, tell them next year we'll, we'll get it to them on time. I said, no, that's not happening. Um, so I scoured the town. I finally found a truck driver who was crazy enough to take that fertilizer over those muddy, slippery, mountainous roads and get the uh, fertilizer to these hamlets. And I'll never forget when we were coming over the hill into this one aldea, we were sliding in the mud, we got stuck, I was covered with mud. I, I had to pay the driver out of my own pocket twice the going rate. But we start blasting the horn and, and the farmers come out and the looks of jubilation on their faces, uh, I'll never forget. And you know, they had other people who hadn't joined the co-op and they were all going, wow, he actually came through. And I, and I realized then how important this little bit of assistance was to these people. It really was going to mean life and death to them and their families because they were going to be able to eat better. And I, uh, I never really recovered from that. The other things I learned in that experience, uh, of the 800 farmers, I didn't really know anything about credit, but you know I had the list of names. So I went around town, said, uh, have you ever made a loan to this guy? And I said, yeah, he's okay. Oh, no, don't, don't make a loan to this guy, you know, because uh, he won't pay. He owes money to everybody in town. So I went down to the co-op manager and said, uh, okay, they're all good except this guy. And the co-op manager said, well, actually, he was here ahead of you, and he told me you were going to probably tell me not to lend to him, but he's good. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll lend to him. And so, of course, of the 800 people I had, only this one guy defaulted. His name was Apollinario Atz. I'm still looking for him. He's <laughs> on the campus. I think he owes me about a million dollars. Um, so, I, you know, I learned that the people, poor, but very honest, and, you know, kept to their commitments. And then the other thing was the impact, you know, seeing how transformative these small loans were. And so I went back to, uh, you know, after my two years, I thought, okay, time to go home. Got to, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I got to get back into my life, whatever it's going to be. Uh, so, you know, I left, and the other thing that made a huge impression on me was, uh, you know, when I told the people of the co-op, look, it's been great, see ya, you know, uh, they were just horrified, you know, they said, they begged me not to go, I mean, I really felt wretched, you know, um, and they said, because, you know, if you leave, this is all going to go away, I said, no, no, don't worry about it, some other gringo is going to come and replace me. <laughs> You know, he'll be just as good or whatever. But they didn't believe it, you know. They had developed a trust in me. And I realized, it just hit me like a truck. I really had made a difference, you know. I had mattered, you know, for the first time in my life to a bunch of people. So I never really got over that. I went back to New York. I toiled at different jobs. Uh, it was in the middle of a pretty serious economic downturn. Uh, you know, there was a, it was actually right after OPEC organized the cartel and quadrupled the price of gas. There were gas lines, and there was unemployment, no jobs. I mean, thank God we solved that problem of our dependence on hydrocarbons. You know? <laughs> <laughs> thank God. You know? um, but anyway, so I couldn't find a job. I was basically unemployable. You know, I, I was still kind of a socialist in my outlook and, you know, people would say, well, what do you want to do? And I'd say, well, I don't want to do anything to support the capitalist system or whatever. Uh, I'd say, okay, well, the door is over there. Thank you very much. Um, so I was kind of desperate and I thought, well, what can I do? Okay. The only skill I have is I can speak Spanish. Uh, and that probably is going to be useful here somehow in New York. So I called up a tutoring agency and they said, well, We've got a situation might work for you. There's the Wilfred Beauty Academy, 
on Broadway and 62nd Street, and they have a lot of Latino women who are studying to be hairdressers, uh, but they can't really pay much tuition, but if you can get them to pass the high school equivalency exam in Spanish, then they will qualify for student aid, and we can charge them a lot of money for their tuition. Sounds like an ethical operation. <laughs> so uh, I worked there. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was you know a total failure. I trained. I tried to train all these women, but uh, you know I guess I wasn't good enough at it because they all flunked the exam. Because the poor proprietor didn't make any money. Uh, on the side, I was I was also doing sales work for a vocational school. Uh, but I didn't make a single sale. I actually did make one, but the other salesman in the place stole my client. Um, and I guess what happened uh, to me when I had been sent out to this upper middle class suburb to try to talk these young women who were all going to Harvard or Princeton or whatever into scrapping that plan <coughs> and going to vocational school to be a medical assistant or medical secretary so they could marry a rich doctor. This, this was the owner of my, uh, of this vocational school's plan. Now, that had worked very well in the 50s when he was a young salesman. I tried to convince him times had changed. You know, that wasn't going to be interesting to these people, but he kept sending me out there and I'd have to do my spiel in front of the class. And, uh, you know, I wasn't good at it, as I've explained, but in one of those sessions, a teacher said, hey, we found out you were in the Peace Corps uh, in Guatemala. Why don't you tell the kids about that? And so I started to explain, you know, my experience about, uh, you know, Guatemala and everything, and it just poured out of me. And uh, I, I just realized at that moment, you know, I really still care about this. I've got to get back into it. I really don't care about being a salesman, you know. So, went back to grad school, University of Wisconsin. I got two master's degrees uh, in two years. I was anxious to just get some, you know, some kind of credentials and get back to work. Uh, I went to a lot of interviews, and it was the same thing. I would interview for these jobs, bank for cooperatives in Minnesota, uh, the, the local government in Madison, Wisconsin. I would get to the last interview, you know, where they were going to make me the offer, and they would say, so, are you excited about coming to work here? And I would go, <sighs> I just couldn't, I couldn't, you know. So I thought, okay, now I'm in trouble. I've finished grad school, I owe a lot of money, uh, I have a baby on the way, and I have no job. Great work. Good, well done, Rue. You know, so uh, I'm kind of coming out of the student union, groggy with a few pints of old style, and uh, I see this thing on a bulletin board that says, "Looking for ex Peace Corps volunteers who speak Spanish and can write." And I thought, "That's me. Yeah, they're looking for me." <laughs> so uh, I sent my CV, such as it was, off, you know, and didn't think anything would come of it. Uh, a week later, a letter comes back with a plane ticket to the Dominican Republic and a check for $1,500 and a yellow post-it saying, you're hired, meet me in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, this, was my, this was John Hatch, who was the co-founder of Lincoln. He never interviewed me. You know? um, and so I guess my point there is, you know, leave some room uh, in your life for dumb luck or magic or whatever. I, th I think, I, I, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but I think if you are on a path and you're trying to do something good, trying to make a contribution, things, people will help you, things will help you, uh, it, it can happen. So let's see what happened next. Okay, now I know there's a lot of uh, arguments uh, in the microfinance field, who invented microfinance, right? Mohamed Yunus, Acción Comunitaria in Peru. Well, this drawing uh, 
was actually discovered in the caves of Alasco down in the Dordogne of southern France. Carbon dating tells us it's over 3,000 years old. So I think this settles the dispute. Uh, I would also point out that, you know, Mohammed Yunus got the Nobel Peace Prize for making his first microfinance loans in the late 70s. And if you've been paying attention, uh, I made mine in the early 70s. So after, you know, this talk, I want you to go online and go to the website justiceforrupert.org <laughs> and, uh, you know, help me recover the prize, which is rightfully mine. <laughs> um, this, you know, this was actually, this was a John Hatch drawing, which we used in our first <coughs> manuals when we were explaining how to do village banking. Concept was, you know, beautifully simple. Just, you know, put $50 loans in people's hands. Where it changed from the days when I did this in Guatemala was now we were lending to women uh, and we were thinking about that little guy in her arms. And the re main reason we lent to the women was they were more, actually they were bigger risk takers than the men. You know, they would... Uh, and why were they more uh, more enterprising, if you will? Well, because you know the woman probably her parents were dirt poor, their parents were dirt poor before them, uh, and she's determined that that child is not going to grow up in poverty. That child is going to escape from poverty, and we give her the means, in this case, capital. Uh, to start some micro-enterprise, raise chickens, eggs, uh, go in the market and sell onions and tomatoes. Now this worked unbelievably well in the early days. There's a lot of controversy about how well it's working today. We'll talk about that hopefully. But in the early days, capital was so scarce, you know, that you put it into a community where you know, there was a lot of underutilized labor. It's like basic economics, right? A little bit of capital paired with a lot of underutilized labor, and you get a big, big effect, a big payoff. So this worked brilliantly, um, but we had a problem rolling it out. John and I had a small consulting firm. We were pretty much just, you know, getting by on our fees. We are dining out in you know, countries all over the world having a great time. Uh, we were putting our part of our profits into this wonderful idea we were piloting, uh, but we really couldn't do much because we didn't have much money and we didn't have, you know, any human resources other than just the two of us. So John hit on this idea. He said, let's teach all, let's figure out, you know, Let's pick like a dozen NGOs that do have money and do have people that are working where we want to work, uh, and let's train them, you know, and let them implement it. Okay, so we did that for a while, and it worked really well. Uh, you know, we would go in and hold a seminar with 20 NGOs in, say, Honduras, and, you know, we would explain our little drawing, you know, from the cave, and they would go, yeah, well, it sounds great, but the people won't pay you back, or poor people can't use, they'll consume the money, you know, it won't work, it won't work. And John would say, all right, let's cut it off right there. Take me to the poorest community that you know of in Tegucigalpa. I will hold a seminar with the people in that community. We'll see who wants to join a village bank. We'll form a village bank. I'll write you the check. You have nothing to risk. And we'll be back in four week, uh, sorry, four months, and you tell me if it worked or it didn't. So of course uh, it did work. We came back in four months, and the people would say, "Wow, this is amazing! You know, the people paid us back, and we've got 30 other <coughs> communities lined up for this thing." I mean, it was working brilliantly, except for one thing. You know, we would do that initial seminar. We'd maybe do some consulting gigs with one or two of them. And then they'd say, okay, we got it, we'll take it from here, and we'd have to start all over again. And uh, I, I told John, look, uh, this is getting tiring, and I can't really see how this is going to allow us to build an organization to deliver this. And we had arguments on the board and everything, but ultimately I convinced the board, let's do four 
pilot projects. Uh, let's pick four countries in Latin America and let's plant the Finca flag. Uh, and so what we did was we hired four social entrepreneurs, three women, one guy. Uh, we gave them each a stake of $10,000. Uh, we trained them in the methodology and we paid them the princely sum of $500 a month salary and we said go to it. <coughs> and again, uh, whether it was luck, we picked the right people, or maybe, you know, in those early days, the demand was so enormous that it simply couldn't fail. <coughs> but those four pilot projects <coughs> grew into pretty big programs. Eventually, they had thousands of clients, millions of dollars in the portfolio, all off that little $10,000 uh, thing of seed capital. So now, we're really moving. So, um, to fast forward, sort of, we filled out Latin America, we entered some more countries, uh, we went to Africa. I got a call one day from some group out in Minneapolis. They said, hey, we have a, we're a, just a community group, we're just business people. And a friend of ours uh, from Uganda uh, said he came across Finca and he thinks it would be just perfect for Africa, you know and his little village, you know, what would it take to get you to go there? And, you know, normally I would have said, oh, just pay half my airfare, and we're there. But by now, these Latin American programs were growing and starting to demand more and more from us in the fundraising area. So I thought, well, <coughs> I'm not sure if we want to go to Africa, so I'll name an absurd price tag, and she'll leave me alone. So I said, well, we'd go for 100000 and she didn't hear anything on the other end of the phone for a while, but then she said, oh. <laughs> so I didn't think I'd ever hear from her again, but a week, uh, sorry, a month later, she called me up and said, okay, Rupert, we have the money, when can you go to Uganda? <laughs> so, all right. So I get on a plane, I go to Uganda, uh, and I figure, well, God, we haven't worked in Africa before, so let me do a little, you know, at least kind of a pretend Study. So I went around and I talked to the bankers and in Kampala, and they all said <coughs> unequivocally, oh, this will never work in Africa. Okay, I know it works in Latin America and Asia, it never will work in Africa. The people won't pay you back, uh, and they won't even be interested in your small loans. So I was really concerned, and I thought, hmm, well, so I called up my helpline. Mohammed Yunus was on our board at the time. I said, Mohammed, what do I do? The people are telling me that, you know, we've got to change the methodology. It's not going to work like in Latin America. And he gave me brilliant advice, I thought, and I'll pass it on to you. Because uh, I think we all have that moment of insecurity, you know, Oof, you know, what am I doing? And he said, don't change it at all. He said, implement it exactly like in Latin America. And if it doesn't work, then change it. And so that's what we did. We did it. We replicated Latin America down to the last detail, and it worked brilliantly. Um, in this one village we went to, Kimantu, when I first went there, you know, the women were, you know, they'd been gathered there by uh, this guy from Minnesota who had moved to the States. He came back. He was persuading them this is really a great thing. They were all very scared, you know. Uh, one woman asked me, how much are you going to lend us? And I said, well, we'll start with 50,000 shillings. It's about $50. And she was just, she almost fainted. She said, oh my God, we could never handle that much money, you know? How could we possibly repay that? So I said, look, it doesn't have to be that. You know, take 25, take 10. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's up to you. So when we came back four months later to see how they were doing, I mean, the, the, again, the, the town was transformed. All the women were smiling. They all had businesses. They were all making money. Um, and this one woman who had been afraid to borrow 50000 said, I just have one complaint. She said, you know, 50000 is not enough. I need 100000 <laughs> And another, uh, another woman said, I, I was asking them, so how has your life changed since you joined Finca? This one woman said, well, the skin on my knees is smooth now. 
and I thought that that's a non sequitur if I ever heard one. Uh, so what what does that mean? She said, well, before Finca came, when I needed money to buy salt or pay school fees for my kids, I had to crawl across the dirt floor of my house and beg my husband. But now that I have my own income, I can pay for these things myself, and my husband crawls across the floor <laughs> begging me for money. So anyway, that uh, was our start in Africa. From there, again, Providence or whatever, uh, we met a woman named Rosa Otunbaeva from Kyrgyzstan back in 1995. She was the ambassador from Kyrgyzstan to the U.S. The Soviet Union was breaking apart. Everybody was wondering what's, you know, what's going to happen. Can we, you know, is this the beginning of a millennium of peace? Can, you know, is this going to be great? And everybody was saying, all right, how can we help these countries, you know, that used to belong to the evil empire, uh, develop along the lines of a market economy? And, uh, and Rosa uh, was, you know, very enlightened, and she'd heard about microfinance from somewhere. So she went to AID and said, I want microfinance in my country. And the USAID guy said, no, no, we don't. No, you want macro uh, credit, you know, you want big loans, that type of thing. And uh, but she insisted, and so we came at her behest or her request. And you know, I remember when we first went to Kyrgyzstan, you know, driving along those deserted steps, you know, and the Soviet <coughs> economy had collapsed. You just saw burnt out, idle factories and everything. I thought, well, what are we going to do here? You know, I mean, I don't see anybody who would take a loan. But uh, once we started lending, we, stuck, we set up shop, it started to really uh, grow. And today, one in every 10 people in Kyrgyzstan uh, is in a family that uh, gets a microloan, not just a microloan, but from feet. We have over 100,000 clients there. So uh, on, to, on, to, um, on to Afghanistan. <coughs> And the Middle East. Um, I wanted to say a bit about innovation, and actually I'm going to race through this because I want you guys to have some time to talk. Um, one of the things we learned, or one of the mistakes we made, we had some pretty serious frauds in the mid-90s, which coincided with me taking the helm of Thinka, sadly. Um, and we probably over invested in internal controls and internal audit and while we were obsessed with preventing more frauds the competition began to improve on our model and began to overtake us uh, at least in Latin America um, fortunately we came to our senses we began to innovate again we began to upgrade our human resources diversify our product lines <coughs> and so uh, today we're we're actually uh, at nine. We're actually probably number one again in a lot of the markets where we're working. Very quickly on the financial model, we started out with donations. I as I explained, uh, then we began to leverage donations with loans, commercial loans, and now we're at kind of the end game or the final stage where we've actually created an equity company, a holding company, we've put in our affiliates uh, or subsidiaries as our contribution and we've raised about $75 million from five social investors, very important social investors for whom the social impact is equally or more important than the financial return. Um, so let me, uh, let me stop there. Uh, because I need to hear from you guys because I understand we're getting booted out of this so. so raise those hands uh, thank you for coming tonight first of all um, I actually had a question regarding um, and this question um, is very in line with what I just discussed in my, one of my higher classes we actually had the Grammy Bank one of our case studies mm -hmm. in Bangladesh so I know you talked about um, that one man who was not loanable, you know, he defaulted and stuff. 
But another issue that we discussed in my class was for the loans that you do give out, how do you follow up and how do you ensure that they're being used for the purposes intended? I know in, in one circumstance we talked about an individual taking out a loan and instead of using it for agricultural purposes or entrepreneurship, they paid like for a family wedding or something. Mm -hmm. And there are some things like that. How do you ensure that the funds are being used appropriately? Uh, the short answer is we we actually don't. <clears throat> and and when I tell you that our our uh, default rate is under one percent on a portfolio which is now a half a billion dollars, you'd, you'd say how can you do that? Well, what we do do is we only lend to people who have a micro enterprise. But you know, and we use I used this example earlier. <clears throat> um, if somebody comes to you and says, and they've been a good client. You've helped them build their business, and they say, "I really want to buy a color TV, you know, and I need five hundred dollars." If you tell them, "Sorry, we don't finance consumption," they'll go back and they'll come back a week later. I need five hundred dollars for my business. <laughs> so we don't want to force them to lie to us. As long as you know, we still do the analysis. Can, do they have the capacity to repay us? Uh, we do a lot of due diligence on the front end, you know, making sure they have a business, you know, if, if, particularly if they want a larger loan, figuring out the cash flow and all that stuff. Um, so microfinance is becoming a very large sector, and I was wondering if you could comment on how you feel about the possible risks of FINCA getting too big, or also the entry and growth of a lot of um, microfinance institutions that don't necessarily have a social mission. Well, uh, two, a, a couple of things. One thing that we're doing in Finca, we've established a social uh, performance audit committee, which has equal standing with our financial audit committee. And basically, their job is to hold management to the mission. And in every board meeting, say, all right, where's the evidence of the impact? How many people are we helping you know, to get out of poverty? Uh, how poor are the people that are coming into Finca? Uh, the other thing we're doing is in our holding company, unlike a lot of, uh, of commercial models, the board, neither the board members nor the employees are getting shares in the holding company. The, the nonprofit is the majority owner. It has 65%, and the other investors are, are institutional social investors like the German Development Bank and the Dutch Development Bank and the World Bank. Um, so we've, we've uh, aligned the interests of our employees and our board members with building wealth among the clients, not personally enriching ourselves. Uh, at, the, at the level of the industry, we've created a group which we call the Microfinance CEO Working Group, the MCWG, <laughs> and with props to uh, my dog in Long Beach and the LD. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and what we're doing is at the MAC, at the industry level, we're saying, all right, we need to distinguish between who's a social. Uh, a socially motivated microfinance organization whose goal is to build wealth at the bottom of the pyramid and someone who's just in it to make money. We're not casting rocks at them. Well, some of them, you know, some of the really predatory commercial lenders that are, you know, really over indebting people. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we are not over indebting people. We are adhering to client protection principles. We're transparent about our pricing. So this is a group of 10 basically pretty large microfinance networks that are working with. Let's try this side. Anybody? Go ahead. 